and we we campaign, we live simply, we indulge in public witness and mutual encouragement. We're volunteer led, have over a thousand members and we have a regular series of Green Christian workshops Emma, on a Wednesday, first Wednesday in March. So for March, we invited them to come along and join with you at Faith for the Change. And I'm delighted to see a number of Green Christian members in the, in the audience tonight have taken up that invitation. So welcome to you. Okay, so how did the Loaf Principles begin? What was their origin? Well, as Emma said, Loaf stands for food that's locally produced, organically grown, and more friendly or fairly traded. And if we want to live on a sustainable planet, we just need to use our loaf. For any unfamiliar with this meaning of loaf, it means use your head, your common sense. Because it's, it's really important to think about food and to have sustainable food for a great many reasons. First reason food is important is human survival. Without it, you know, we wouldn't get very far. And then there's the effect agriculture has on biodiversity for good and ill. There's the impact of food production on climate breakdown. Today, 26% of global greenhouse gas emissions come from food systems, 30% directly from livestock and fisheries. Emissions from food alone would currently take us far beyond the goal of less than 1.5 degrees centigrade of warming, unless we start to radically reduce food emissions alongside energy emissions. So way back in the late 1990s, Christian Ecology Link, as we then were, now Green Christian, started thinking about where our food comes from. Back then, some of you with long memories might remember that um, Tim Lang was beginning to talk about food miles. The Soil Association was the only show in town for understanding the value of nurturing and feeding the soil not just seeing it as a bit of dust to sow the, the crops into and add chemicals to them. On animal welfare, FWAG was already going, that's the Farming and Wildlife Advisory Group, for farming in a way kind to wildlife. And some of the animal concern groups were already going, Compassion in, well, in Farming was going, Catholic Concern for Animals, the Anglican Society for the Welfare of Animals, they were all going. Fair trade, however, was just beginning. Um, Tradecraft, founded over 40 years ago, pioneered the fair trade and developed it globally, Recon got the fair trade mark recognized. Sadly, uh, just gone into administration, but they did a really wonderful job in the early days. And of course, we all remember fair trade stores in our churches. So back in, I reckon it was something like 1998, I uh, was looking for some acronym, some campaign phrase that we could use for a campaign on loaf. And I was just jotting words down on the back of an envelope the way one does. And I, the word organic came out and we want to be fair trade and very important to be caring about the animal side of things and local. And I suddenly realized that the beginning letters of those four words actually made the word loaf. Uh, so I took it to the CL board and George Dentar, then chair, said, well, we can call it Use Your Loaf. And there we are. That's how it started. And it's quite amusing. Over the, over the years, uh, we're talking about 25 years on now, people do every now and again come up to Green Christian and say, have you heard of the Loaf Principles? And we have to say, well, yeah, actually, we thought of them. <laughs> so... But one important thing I want to get across at the start is to understand these principles are not intended to be prescriptive. They're, they're starting points for discussion and thinking about how we source our food. And if you can only follow one principle, that's a great start. Just because you can't do everything doesn't mean you do nothing. Now, we, we right from the beginning, we realized very clearly that bread has a great symbolic meaning for Christians. I mean, the gospels, Jesus describes himself as the bread of life. When we prepare the bread and wine at communion, we say, we break this bread to share in the body of Christ. Although we are many, we're one body because we all share in one bread. 
And we even got Jesus's parables of the loaves, a, a Jesus parable in the way of the loaves and fishes. And when we started our Join Enough program for looking at alternatives to economics, that parable of the loaves and fishes is very relevant to overconsumption. Sharing means enough for all. So there's a lot of symbolism there behind the loaf principles for Christians. Now, what I'd like to do now, before I go into the principles in any depth, I've got a task for all of you. I want you to use the chat function, or if you're not used to using it, just, just at least open it up so you can see what other people are putting in. And I'm going to put four questions to you. And I want you to put a one word or phrase answer into the chat. So my first question is, what does local mean to you? What do you expect if you buy local? Put what that means to you in the chat now, if you would, please. And we can see what everyone's thinking. Thank you. So what must leave? Great, yeah, not travel more than 20 miles, grown nearby, farm shops, the Wirral, village, supporting local business, produced locally, produced near me, within 50 miles, the UK, depends. Least grown in the UK, local farm, local independent shops, close to home as possible, shop I can work to. Fantastic. Okay, right. My second question is on organic. If you buy organic food, what benefit do you think, expect, hope to get for yourself or for the planet? So what benefit do you expect to get if you buy organic food? Healthier, no chemicals, tastier, reduces emissions, benefits to wildlife, Better taste, better soil for the planet, yep. Environmental, yep. Better biodiversity, hasn't got pesticides on it, hasn't harmed the environment. Yep. Vitamins, minerals, etc. Excellent. Okay, right. My third question is, and this is a why question. Why should we bother about animal welfare? So why should we bother about animal welfare? Christian duty to care for creation. Animals are indeed sentient beings, part of God's creation. Better quality meat, created by God. I lost that one. <laughs> All God's creatures. Yes, they do suffer like humans, but not so efficient at feeding. We're all part of the same creation. Lovely. All right. And my final question is why? Another why question. Why? Buy fair, true, fair trade food and drink. Why should we do that? Why do we do that? Justice for the growers, absolutely. More money to producers, yep. Fair income for producers, yep. Justice, wouldn't want to be exploited. Why should I exploit others? Help develop poorer countries, there are lots of drawbacks. Yep, excellent. Okay, thank you very much. And I, in fact, I, I, might, I think I might as well go home. We can finish, you know. They've Please done don't. It. <laughs> they've done the workshop, they've done the talk. <laughs> okay, I'm going to share my screen now. Um, uh, there we go. All right. Okay. So what I'm going to do now is just to tease out those four loaf principles a little bit more. Um, this is, well, it's, it's my husband in my garden. Ed was an absolutely wonderful food gardener. Those who have read his books will know he was passionate about growing fruit and vegetables. And he planted something in the region of 70 or 80 fruit trees in our garden. Um, I don't know whether you can see this, apple. Um, I am looking after his apple trees. This is a Crawley Beauty, a Sussex apple, and it's the latest keeper that I've got. And I am managing to prune and look after his fruit trees for him. He died three years ago. I have reduced the vegetables bits. 
and I'm not quite as dedicated a gardener as he was. He would be out in all weathers, snow, rain, whatever, tending his vegetable garden. And he reckoned he could think best with his hands in the soil. So that's a little picture of it as it was. And the vegetable beds are a little bit smaller now. But you don't need to have a garden of that size. You can just grow food easily in a little garden. This is Tony Emerson's front garden in Streatham with those lovely luscious raspberries growing there. So you don't need a lot of space to grow a little bit of food. Or you can get an allotment. Allotments, Jacqueline Dow there, the wife of one of our co-chairs, George, and that was their allotment when they were living in South London. And allotments are brilliant. If you don't know a huge amount about growing food, there's always people on an allotment who know and are willing to share their knowledge with you. And if you have grown some of your own food, you can produce some fantastically impressive dishes. Oh, sorry, I'm not in the Zoom call. You can provide some fantastically impressive dishes with fruit from your garden. So this is a pavlova made with free range eggs and the fruit on top is a Deniston gauge, uh, pink currants and boysenberries, all from my garden. Just a small amount of fruit and absolutely fantastic and really tasty because it's grown organically. But if you can't grow food in your garden or you, obviously you can't grow all that you need, then we've got farmers markets, which a number of you mentioned. This is Borough in London. And I think the London regulations are something like food for within a hundred miles. But a lot of the smaller town farmers markets have their food coming in from a much shorter distance, say 20 or 30 miles. But you can be sure that it's grown within reasonable distance at least in the UK, if you go to a farmer's market. Or of course, most of us, even if we're growing food in our own gardens or allotments, we also go to the shops. So that's when we need to, to be conscious of the labels if we're thinking about local, to see where our food came from. These are some stats from Mike Berners-Lee, how bad a bad banana's fame. Now, there are a couple of startling ones there. A banana that comes from the other side of the world comes out there with the least number of carbon emissions. But when you think about it, banana ripens slowly, so it can easily be transported in a ship and therefore uses far less greenhouse gas emissions than out of season strawberries flown in from Africa. But do note the difference between in season strawberries, 150 grams, and out of season strawberries, 1.8 kilogram. So if you buy UK strawberries, they will be a lot less carbon intensive than out of sea some ones flown in from far away. Uh, there's just one stat there I do have a question mark about. I do still eat meat. And um, if I go and get some lamb for a special occasion from my local butcher, and it's been raised on the Romney marshes, just along from me, the other side of, of Hastings, I really do question whether that's really used 38 kilograms. So I think there are always, this has to be just a guide. Now, one of the things about buying local is there are lots of reasons for it. I've listed, as I listed quite a lot of them there, just to pick out a couple of them. Uh, the local economy. Now, if you spend a pound in a local shop owned by a local person, the likelihood is that pound will be then spent back into the local economy. If you spend a pound in the supermarket, Sainsbury's, Asda's, whatever, it goes into the big national or international pot and it will be spent who knows where. So it does help the local economy if you go to local shops. Uh, online and supermarkets are not always the best or the cheapest. You can often get really good deals and good quality stuff in your local shop in your high street. Um, oh, and the one I do like, if things go wrong, instead of being left waiting on a call centre line for an hour to try and complain, you can actually go down to the shop you bought it from and you can just make your complaint in person much easier. OK, on to the organic part of the loaf principles. I got this from the Soil Association website. There are four principles of organic agriculture. 
health of the soil, the plant, the animals and the human, based on the living ecological systems, based on building relationships that ensure fairness and caretaking. Now the Soil Association, if you see that label, obviously you can be really sure that they're being grown to these principles because that grower will have had to be registered with the Soil Association and will be inspected. But you may well know of a local farmer who is growing really to organic standards, but hasn't got the Soil Association registration. There may be a farmer near you who's building to the regenerative principles, which is the new idea, or the wilder farmed farm, where you've got cover crops being sown, no plough, no dig, put into operation on a farming scale and drilling the seeds directly into the cover crops, which is ben very beneficial for wildlife. So you may have some of those other systems that are not soil association registered, but they're pretty similar. And for good reasons to try organic. You'll all know these, better for nature and planet. You had these all in the chat. Better animal welfare, organic means free range. Know what's in your food. You're not gonna have any GM organisms in there. And yeah, it's tasty because the organic grown methods they feed the soil the soil is healthy it's full of microorganisms it's all kinds of worms and other creatures in that soil which is giving flavor to the crops that are grown in it now when we come to eating meat we then have a big question and um, as i said i do still eat meat but we do have to ask and I do keep asking myself, is this a good, should we eat meat and fish? If you buy animals from organic principles or where they're outdoor range, the animals do have a good life, but we're still killing them to eat them. But then lots of things die. If we eat vegetables, we're probably eating vegetables that had the pests on them killed one way or another. I don't allow slugs to chew all my vegetables in the garden or I'd have none. So death is a part of life, but what? So the underlying question, this is very fundamental though. Why care for creation? And we care because God loves it, calls us to care for it, attend to its flourishing, add to its abundance. And in that we too flourish and enter God's joy. So these are really important questions that each of us has to wrestle with. Many of Green Christians members are vegetarian or vegan, but others like myself do still eat meat products. And the animal friendly part of our loaf principles has always been for everyone, meat eaters, vegetarians, vegans. But, and if you do still eat meat products, then it's really incumbent upon us to consider the welfare of the animals and the animal products that we consume. And you will all know this, buy free range for eggs, simplest thing you can do for the hens. Though at the moment with the bird flu, that's been a huge problem, just as we'd got so many people changing to free range eggs. So the chickens had got a better life. Sadly, a lot of them now have had to be contained again because of this terrible bird flu. But nevertheless, the principle is good. And hopefully we can return to that. Free range chicken, poultry, pork, grass fed beef and lamb. So if you're buying meat, it's important to make sure that that's what you're buying. Dairy, again, look for organic products, particularly soil association. But again, you may know local sources that are just as good. And that guarantees dairy cows, sorry, have access to pasture and grazing. Fish, buy sustainable or organic fish. Look for the Marine Stewardship Council logo to ensure that fish is sustainable. Fair trade. I'm going to say very little about because Sarah's going to be talking about that in just a moment. Um, but I'll just mention that this is myself and our local MP, Hugh Merriman, who until recently, he's now Railway Minister. He may have dropped his APP job, but he was Vice Chair of the Fair Trade APPG in Parliament. So he's a keen supporter of Fair Trade. We were there to encourage the shop owners here and encourage them to do more. They're already doing well with their clothes and in their cafe. So that was an encouragement situation there. And 
finally, we have a lot of resources on our website. So if you go to the website and click on the activities and go to the food section, you'll see this entry page. Lots of resources here to help you in eating together. We encourage churches to have communal meals where the food that is consumed and the drink that's consumed complies with those principles. Church resources, sermons, liturgies, posters and leaflets. We've got a section two on why food matters. That is talking about regenerative farming, talking about GM, our thoughts on what these things matter to us. We also have specific things for harvest and we've got three different harvest festival services. One for a Eucharist service, communion service, one very informal and the other one, a new one, which Andy Bauscher has done for us, which is a very reflective modern service to be used during harvest. Right, that was a very quick whip through the use your loaf principles. And I hope I didn't bore you with, with saying all the things you already knew, because a lot of you here are very much with it already on this. Mm. Thank you, um, Emma. Oh, I don't know whether we've got time for a question or two, but. Yep, I think we have. Yeah, thank you so okay. much, Barbara. That was really interesting. And I learned a few facts there. Good to know that bananas are so low. <laughs> in terms of carbon I do like bananas but yeah really interesting thank you very much if anybody would like to put a question to Barbara then uh if you want to just unmute yourself and ask the question that would be great we've only got five minutes before we move on to Sarah but if you'd like to ask a question uh please feel free or put it in the chat if you'd rather not unmute yourself Sophie over to you Okay, thank you. Uh, I'm vegetarian because I thought the main, well, the main reason why I'm vegetarian is that I was told it takes so much more cereals to feed um, the beef. I think it's 20 kilos of cereals to make one kilo of beef. And therefore 20 kilos of cereals could feed a lot more humans. Is that not the main reason? That is a very good reason, Sophie. Yes, I couldn't cover everything. So thank you for bringing yeah. that in. I think that there's no, every, I think we're all in total agreement um, that we need to eat a lot less meat than we than we were accustomed to doing in the past. And the meat that we do eat is important, it's, it's got from um, local to us, so we're not importing soya, and that it's pasture fed. So the animals are just being given a small amount of grain um, when the pasture needs supplemented, but they're mainly eating grass. And in that way, they, there are a lot of the, I lived in Yorkshire for a number of years and got to understand the connection between the, the animals that were on the land in the Yorkshire Dales and the beauty of the Dales with the variety of the flowers and the, you know, so if they're, if it's small scale and it's not too overgrazed land, um, animals can be very beneficial for the whole biodiversity. Right. So there, are, there are pros and cons, but certainly meat that has been these huge feeding lots where the animals are just fed grain, that's, no. That's that's not good at all. Thank right, you. That's the difference now. Thanks. Thank you. Anybody else? We have one more minute left for questions. No, everyone's gone quiet. Barbara, you covered everything so well. I don't think so. Come questions? on, there must be something else you want to challenge me on. Uh, well, <laughs> if people prefer to hang around at the end then and, and chat in perhaps a smaller group, then you're very welcome to do that. But if it's okay with you, we'll move on to Sarah. Thanks ever so much, Barbara, for that. So our second speaker this evening is Sarah Parker. Uh, Sarah is a reader in development studies at Liverpool John Moores University, where she's worked since 1994. She is passionate about fair trade and helped establish Liverpool as a fair trade city and is a trustee and current chair of Liverpool World Centre. She has run fair trade flag making workshops and established a small community interest company called Fair Connections to sell world fair trade organisation registered products from Nepal. She also teaches sociology at Liverpool John Moores University and will be talking about her work and experiences of pro promoting fair trade over the past 25 years. So Sarah, over to you. Thank you. Great. Can you see the screen? Yep. 
and you can obviously hear me so that's good <laughs> and where's it gone slideshow from the beginning yeah so i just wanted to build actually on um what barbara was said and it is great to see the connection between local organic um, animal friendly and fair trade um, and i think it's really really important because not everything we can buy is fair trade um so um I just want to have a look at some of the challenges as well that we are facing in promoting uh, fair trade. So every day as shoppers, we all go and shop and there's so many logos and brands out there. Um, I could literally, I have a whole module where I do, I used to teach like um, quite a few weeks on trade leading up to fair trade. Um, and, and now over time, it's all got condensed. Um, but just out of interest in the chat, what do you see in the image? Um, if you could just type what you see. And I absolutely love going into primary schools and doing this activity. Um, young children in particular really engage in this idea of fairness and fair trade. Um, and there has been a decline over the past few years in the government's curriculum and promoting global citizenship. So I would argue that organizations, religious organizations, universities, colleges, kids clubs um, need to sort of pick pick some of that up. Um, so yeah, we've got yin yang with the earth, a, a person between the earth and the sky, um, an island near a continent, brilliant. And um, these all come up um, and it's really nice. You can see the person and they are holding their hand up for justice. And you might remember back in the day, the Fair Trade, Fair Trade Foundation was like two Fs sort of integrated. Um, it was black and white. It wasn't as engaging. And this is now one of the most recognized logos, apart from your obvious huge ones like Apple and McDonald's. Um, but children often say that they see a parrot in it. And once you see it as a parrot, it's really hard to not see a parrot. Um, and then I often move on to... Um, Come on, I need to. Yeah, I often move on to show them this logo and ask what they see in this logo, which is kind of people and interconnectedness and this idea of a circle uh, using similar colours. Um, and when I started my fair connections business, which ran from it, it closed down during the pandemic, uh, basically because I'm not very good at business. I'm good at lots of things, but I am definitely not a business woman. Um, I, but um, I created a a logo that merged the two together. And there's two types of fair trade. So there's fair trade one word and fair trade two words. And um, I wrote a sort of storybook about a Nepalese frog and fair trade to emphasize that fair trade, the logo that we're used to is associated with agriculture. And the other logo is more handicraft products. Um, but we do tend to think about food when we think about fair trade um, because it is the most popular logo here. In terms of the reality of fair trade and why we need it, um, trade um, commodity prices are falling, people um, overseas, but this isn't just overseas, it's also an issue for farmers here when they can depend on one or two products, so there's a high level of dependency. And often our farmers have protections in place, like here in the USA, we have sort of quotas and the government supports farmers. Um, to some extent, often more than other countries. So I won't go into the details of the global economic system that underpins um, uneven development. Um, but over time, you had falling prices, monoculture, not good for the environment, not good for farmers, um, not good for anybody. Um, and fair trade, um, as Barbara rightly pointed out, emerged sort of over 20 years ago. And it does very clearly state what it does. It guarantees a better work, better deal for third world producers. Um, there is this kind of imagination that the products are coming from the third world to, to, the, to the first world or the Western or from the global South, which I prefer as a term. So they come from the global South to the global North. But increasingly there's a market in those countries for the products. So it isn't just for people. Um, it isn't just us as consumers. Consumers also exist on, a, on an increasing level um, in the global south and starting to stay local. So if all their local fair trade products stayed local, then we wouldn't have access to them. Um, and it is 
Yes, it, well, yes, good question. I'll come back to that. If commodity prices are falling, which they are, um, the farmers are getting less, but the supermarkets and the people who control the industry are the ones who are profiting from it. And this is when it's interesting when you come to look at where we buy our products. And I, I really like the, the link here to what Barbara's been talking about. So I'll come on to that. Um, so it's fair trade is a partnership. It's about transparency and respect. Um, and it's about greater equity. And it contributes very much to sustainable development. And more recently, it's starting to look at environmental changes and focusing on the environmental benefits of fair trade for um, farmers as well. Um, it's often focused on helping disadvantaged producers because they don't have control to, to get access to the market. And when you go back to the start of fair trade, one of the key things um, that Tradecraft played an amazing role in that process, and it is so sad to see them going. Um, but in terms of having direct, direct links, just as Barbara was saying that you go to your local producer, people would go and visit, develop connections, source ethical sort of coffee and tea in the main um but then it's sort of expanded as we know to lots of different products um and the benefits are more than just an increase in price it isn't just about money so yes a fair trade price is paid now the fair trade foundation has got lots of games you can play that sort of show how much extra farmers get for their products but when you look at a bar of chocolate and you look at the amount that's actually paid to the people who do most of the hard work in growing the cocoa or any other product, it still doesn't ever feel like they're getting enough compared to the marketing, transport, the profits uh, and the other people down the chain. Um, but it does. They do always get more than the minimum price. Um, it never falls below a price. And when the price rises, they get a premium. Um, so long-term contracts um, are really important. So knowing that your buyer is going to buy from you means you can plan, it reduces uncertainty. It means that you will decide to send your children to school and invest in things to improve uh, your land because you have a guarantee of a certain amount of your product being bought at that premium. You do get better quality. Um, it's often more small scale farmers. So it does sort of focus in on those um, benefits. Um, it can shorten the supply chain by cutting out middle, and I say middle men, maybe we should be saying middle people, but it often is men who are involved in the industry, but it, it does um, cut out the middle, a lot of the middle uh, men processes. Cafe Direct is a really good example of using very marketing, good marketing because they use direct, direct from the consumer to the producer in their title. And also the premium that's paid goes back to local community groups. So fair trade wouldn't be anything without cooperatives and the cooperatives that are in those countries that support social projects such as water um, and investing in schools. Uh, but the community decide what um, product. So my chat's just in the way of my slides. I'll have to come back to the chat after because I can't see my slides. The chat just popped up. Um, so the Fair Trade Foundation um, has been very successful in expanding the market. Um, and they play an important role in monitoring, in going out and evaluating, and providing support and educating, and also connecting um, people within the fair trade community globally. Sometimes it can come under criticism. People say, well, a lot of the money is going to run the organization because they have quite a large staff now, but you then have to balance that with the, the products coming into the countries. Um, and if anyone wants to know more information before your fair trade quiz next week, um, I'd just have a really good look on the Fair Trade Foundation. Um, it's full of resources um, explaining what it is in very simple language, but also keeps you up to date. Um, and you can click on there and get stories from the producers. And one of the things I've really uh, appreciated about the Fair Trade Foundation over the past sort of 20, 25 years is that they often bring producers over and do producer tours. Um, as part of Fair Trade Fortnight. And when I'm talking to my students, now bear in mind I teach at John Moores University, so students on average are between sort of 18 and 21. We, we, we still have mature students, but they tend to be um, under 30. Um, 
actually lobbying and if you can't find the products you want um, if you have noticed that there were products on the shelf that are now not there and tea direct is a really good one i often try to buy my co uh, cafe at my co um, the cafe direct and the tea bags from oxfam because then you're supporting oxfam as well which is obviously doing it sort of in enhancing the good but the reality of sort of everyday life is many people uh, shop in supermarkets these products only got into the supermarkets because people lobbied. I remember going back, thinking about when I had my first child 23 years ago, and organic baby food was just not really something um, in the Tesco's uh, supermarkets and people lobbying um, managed to get more and more. So now it's mainstream and the same has happened with fair trade. So lobbying needs to be creative, um, it needs to be engaging, um, and a lot of focus, if I ask people about fair trade, people often think about dressing up as a banana um, and trying to promote people getting engaged in a different activity. If I ask you about the, the sort of top two things, I've already mentioned Cafe Direct. Um, and Cafe Direct is a really interesting example because um, about 10 years ago, it changed its packaging away from the connection between the producer and yourself. So it used to have pictures of the producer on. And then they moved away from that marketing strategy and they had pictures of the tools that were used. So a little bit like the photographs Barbara was showing of the allotment, it had spades and it was trying to make this connection to the environment. But most consumers then couldn't find the product and they lost their fair trade message. So they sort of branding and marketing is really important. Um, Divine Chocolate is another really good example of a company that I know very well, partly because in 1999, my husband, who's Bob Doherty, who quite a lot of people may have met, um, he has come and done talks. Um, he still works in business and his, his research at the moment isn't just all on about fair trade, but it's on food resilience and sustainability. Um, and therefore, again, the loaf principles are really important. So he's working on that at York University. Uh, but as marketing manager for Divine Chocolate Company, I've seen a company grow over time um, and seen how marketing and working with the fair trade networks, doing events with charities as part of Fair Trade Foundation, with community groups and religious groups, has been really important in building up a customer um, relationship with the customer and I just sort of um, when I was trying I always try to update my talks before I give them because some of the data uh, that I have uh, needs updating um, and I just thought in the chat if you could let me know what you think the most sold fair trade products are but by volume in metric tons <laughs> just a so it might not be exactly what you expect um, so if you'd like to just type that in the chat, I'd be quite interested to see what people thought. So we have bananas. Yeah, I can come back to the co-op actually while, while you're just having your... Um, the co-op actually, Bob, my husband, took, um, I think it was Brad from the co-op, to Ghana to meet the fair trade producers. Um, and that was one of the reasons um, when he was working for Divine and the co-op was so impressed by the, the work that was being done that all of their chocolate that's fair trade comes from Ghana and is provided by Divine. Um, Bob's also responsible for getting Divine into places like Tesco's and Sainsbury's, which that's a little bit, you can be critical of it as well because you'd like to buy your products from your local small suppliers. Um, okay, so I'm just trying to read the messages. So coffee beans. Okay, I'll, so from my Google search in preparation, it's flowers and plants. <laughs> so your fair trade roses and um, in particular, very popular bananas is though high up there as you'd imagine. Um, and then I think tea is quite low down, but then I, oh, I was trying to think, is that just because it doesn't weigh a lot? Because I was when I was looking at that, I was thinking that can't be right. Um, so again, I'll provide the, uh, the slides to Emma and and maybe you can have these in your quiz next week. So I want to take a screenshot if you're cheating. <laughs> um, so yeah, there's lots of different products available. And what's interesting over time is from the 70s to today, those products have sort of increased in, in not just the, the products that you can get, 
but also who you can get them from and the companies that you get them from. So the 70s to the 90s were seen quite radical. I remember being at university at Leeds in the 80s and um, one of my friends there was re really committed to fair trade even be before myself. But the coffee tasted terrible. Yeah, it was horrible. Now the quality is what sells it often more than the actual fair trade principles. Um, so it's really good to see that the quality's developed. Um, and but then when Starbucks, when Cadbury's came on board, lots of controversy and discussions and people sort of falling out who don't agree that big companies um, should be. Uh, given the label unless all of their chocolate is fair trade how do and i have no answer to this question but why is kit kat and the and cadbury's buttons fair trade why doesn't cadbury's commit to fair trade for everything and make the shift and this is where we can keep putting pressure on companies we still need lobbying um, this diagram shows how um, over time uh, we've moved away from sort of chocolate to having peanuts. Each basket represents 20 million. So here, as we go through time, the sales start increasing and then bananas come on board and bananas are now one of the biggest sellers. So this is a shelf of fair trade products. And like I said earlier at the start, they're mainly food products. So we can now get fair trade cotton. Um, I think four years ago Marks and Spencers were buying most of the fair trade cotton it's really hard to get hold of so again you still have that dilemma about big companies and how do other people get hold of the products um, fair trade footballs um, again uh, really important that it's not just seen as food one of the challenges now I'm mindful of time I could literally talk about this for hours and um uh, if I came to the quiz, I probably wouldn't win it, though, because there's so much to know and learn. Um, but one of the challenges that we have all faced has been obviously the pandemic and the cost of living crisis. And despite this, fair trade sales have gone up. And I think in some ways, the world pausing for a while um, has made people think about what they buy and what they need. You would hope that things like fast fashion would decline um, as people have needed to buy less, but also I'm hoping the younger generations um, do start to consider a bit more, you know, the choices that they made and what's necessary. So just very briefly, Liverpool's fair trade journey, um, we um, that my husband's there in the middle, <laughs> uh, the double bar was part of the divine um, Divine uh, promotion, getting into schools, having a, a product that was cheaper and more attractive for children because their dark chocolate's very focused on adults. And we were Bruce Crowther. I don't know how many people know or have met Bruce or have heard him talk. He's really inspirational. So Bruce had, was a vet. Uh, Bob had five divine cities because he was promoting the chocolate in five cities. That was all he could afford in terms of his marketing strategy. But Bruce wanted Garstang to be a fair trade town. No, he wanted it to be a divine town because of his links with Ghana. Um, and he'd seen and met a new cocoa farmers. And Bob was on it. I remember sitting in Lark Lane having a conversation about this over a coffee. And Bob was like, I can't extend it to towns. So Bruce went back and had a meeting with three people. It was him, his wife and his babysitter because nobody turned up um, and came up with the idea of a fair trade town movement. And then over time, that grew in Garstang. So Garstang, if you're ever passing, is the first fair trade town. And Bruce is the man. And it, when I talk about Bruce, it gives me goosebumps. He's such an amazing campaigner. Um, that we now have fair trade towns, cities, schools, not only in the UK, but globally. And it was in sort of this time, 99, 2000, that we really started to promote fair trade. And this is my link to Faith for Change. In 2006 and 7, uh, we received small grants to do art workshops, um, myself and Jeanette Porter, and we, it, we did it in six different types of religious institutions to bring communities together to make fair trade. And Barbara, the big sign that you showed before the fair trade uh, banner, uh, the Fair Trade Foundation got children decorating it. And then whoever won got to have their uh, big banner on display. And I just thought, well, that's lovely, but it's not very fair because why do we always have to have a winner? Art should be for all, fair trade should be for all. So I took the idea of the Buddhist prayer flags, which are kind of A4 size. And we got fair trade cotton from, uh, a company 
um, down in Brighton, cut it up into squares, and we hosted and had fair trade flags um, being made over two or three year periods. And sometimes I, I it, every time I get these slides out, I think I really want to do this again. It was just so inclusive. Um, and then the Fair Trade Foundation adapted that idea after seeing it in Liverpool and made fair trade bunting as part of their campaigns. And this exhibition in Liverpool World Museum is actually the river of fair trade, showing how over time the fair trade movement grow, has grown in Liverpool. Um, and again, this is something I would love to revisit. Uh, my, I do a lot of research in Nepal on uh, women and menstruation at the moment. Um, and so I've, I haven't had time to revisit some of this work, but it's something that doing these talks always makes me think, yeah, I need to really get back to it because religious organisations have been central in spreading the word, talking about fair trade, um, talking about um, the loaf principles. You know, if you can't do everything, doing something is so important, but so equally is leaving this meeting today and talking to people, because if everybody then changes one little habit, it has a massive impact. Um, but we have had, um, before the pandemic, we started to find that the fair, we have fair trade schools and universities, um, but it starts to become the same people promoting the same message to in a little bit of an echo chamber. And that's where taking the conversations out um, into our communities is really important, um, out to people who wouldn't necessarily think about fair trade. Uh, the city council was just about, I was the fair trade, well, the fair trade, Liverpool still is a fair trade city, but it's, it's been not very active, mainly due to the pandemic, but also we were transitioning, handing over responsibility to the council uh, because it had been with sort of the universities um, and John Moores uh, for, for quite a long time. Um, and I was struggling to get people to come to meetings. Um, also, there's lots and lots of logos out there now. Um, and it can make the market confusing. And there's so many issues to consider. And I think Barbara's covered those really well. You know, there's four different issues within that one talk and fair trade is just one of them. Just to give you a little insight though, into uh, the work in Nepal, there's a fair trade group, Nepal, and there's about 20, probably 22 organizations who are officially registered as fair trade um, craft producers. And I wrote a book about a frog who goes to visit them to learn about how the bags are made. And what really fascinated me when I took a teacher from Grange over Sands and I've taken teachers from uh, Liverpool um, and they see the women making and they say, Sarah, you always talk about these products being fair trade. What you should be doing is promoting them also as being handmade. How many hands, how many people have benefited in the process of that product coming to you? And if a lot of people, a lot of, and, and, and it is, it's, it's often women, though not exclusively, it depends on the product and the skills, you know, there's a gender dimension. Um, but so many women are involved in making uh, the woven products that I used to bring back and sell um, and still do at small fairs. I still sell them um, because then it means when I go to Nepal, I can buy more products and bring them back. Um, but it was interesting that the handmade was something that's really important. Um, we've also written, and I can send a link around, um, myself, Bob, and a colleague down in uh, Portsmouth have written about how it's not just uh, marketing products from the global south to the global north. There's been a shift in the way they're marketed. It isn't about charity. It is about genuine connections of respect and kind of extending love across uh, the globe. Um, so the marketing has changed a fair trade. And again, some products have been fair trade and then they've moved over to the Rainforest Alliance, pulling on your heartstrings. Do you care about the environmental people? But the Fair Trade Foundation does both. It actually does help to look after the environment um, as well as guarantees uh, a minimum wage. So that can, you can get customer confusion. Um, and the Fair Trade Foundation are particularly uh, 
committed to and connected to the loaf principles because not everything is and can be fair trade but we could start to consider things like why is a pint of milk um cheaper than the same amount of water a liter of milk is cheaper than a liter of water that doesn't make sense so farmers need to be valued and respected here um we need to think about what we pay for our products so um trying to get involved in promoting fair trade having quiz nights talking about it if you connected these three universities they're all fair trade universities but their activities over the past few years really have declined and i think the fair trade foundation needs to re-audit everybody um because otherwise the label becomes meaningless and to get the fair trade foundation um approval to be a town city or school you have to meet criteria not just of procuring products uh, but you have to have marketing you have to have media events like this um, and opportunities um, to get um, into the media as well you need to promote it in the media so that people know I'm going to stop there because I'm mindful of time I think I've gone over and I've tried to be as quick as I can um, but I'm very open to questions and there may be questions that you, me and Barbara could take together as well, because there is such a strong connection between the two topics. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Sarah. Is there anybody that would like to ask Sarah or Barbara a question? I think Catherine has a hand up there. Yes, I've got a question for both speakers. Um, thank you, Sarah and Barbara. It was really helpful and informative. Both talks were. Um, You've talked about, um, Sarah, about tradecraft going into liquidation. And I have heard a positive spin on that, um, that actually their job is less needed because of the supermarket stocking. And obviously the availability of fade, uh, fair trade in supermarkets is great. Um, but you've also mentioned that people shop in different ways. Some are not very intentional, but um, affordability and time come into it. So what benefits do you think there are in, in also having small shops that sell fair trade specifically where those who can afford to, and there have been comments on, in the chat that many people couldn't afford to, but where those people who could afford to could go and buy fair trade or could go and buy locally grown. As Barbara, you mentioned, there are added benefits to a local shop selling locally grown if, if we want to return something, it's easier. So do you think there are benefits in having both small shops and supermarkets stocking fair trade and to an extent locally grown food? From my perspective and, and it's personal, I think it really is important to have fair sort of small shops as well because supermarkets, yes, they have a lot of fair trade products, uh, but that's very precarious and they can change at the, at the at a whim to decommission them. They don't have the same genuine relationship. Though I would argue, I think from my knowledge and experience, um, the co-op do form very gen sort of genuine relationships um, with their producers more than the, the bigger supermarkets. And it's a little bit like if I was going to buy a chocolate bar, would I buy a Cadbury's one or would I buy one that was made by an independent? And I'd, I'd rather have a more expensive chocolate and eat less of it than eat more of a cheaper one. Um, but I also think there's a value to the small community shops like sort of trade, well, so Oxfam and Tradecraft and the products in terms of just creating connections between people as well. You know, we all know when you go into a small shop, you might buy something else. Not everything's always more expensive. Sometimes they are the same price. Um, but I think one of the challenges that people have faced as well with the fair trade school movement is when the children are coming home and they're going around the supermarket telling mummy and daddy to buy everything with this logo on. And you're like, hang on a minute. I, I we all we, the people do recognize that people have budgets and things are going to get more challenging. Uh, but it is interesting that fair trade product sales have gone up. Um, and I think somebody put it in the chat. I saw it pop up and it's often people with the least money who will actually not only buy fair trade products, but they will also be the most generous giving to charities um, because they feel that connection. They, they, can, they can connect um, and want to value other people's time. But yeah, it's a challenge. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'd agree. I mean, it's, I think both is good. I remember being a bit heartbroken when my local um, raw deal 
um, shop that sold all these wonderful things in Ripon was challenged, was went out of business because the local supermarket started stocking the fair trade and healthy foods that they had been. But I think it, as so many people do buy in the larger supermarkets, it's really good that they are stocking a lot more fair trade goods and organically and sustainable goods now. Um, one thing I'd add is the importance of cafes and getting cafes to sell mm. restaurants, to sell fair trade tea, coffee, biscuits, wine, you know, I think that that could be um, stressed a little bit more. I think it's a good way of getting the message across to people. If it's open, if they're obviously making a feature, that's even better. Well, Anne Litherland, I think it is, has got her hand up. Uh, if people do need to go, um, then perhaps we should just come to an end. And if people want to hang on to ask more questions, then that would that would be absolutely fine. I think our speakers are happy to hang around a little bit. But if I just bring things to a close for this moment, um, and then if people want to hang around, that's fine. But I thought it would just be nice just to um, to end with a prayer uh, about all the things that we've talked about today. So if if you'd like to join in with that, uh, then please do so. To Heavenly Father, you call us to love our neighbours near and far, to show love that is generous in practical ways, that doesn't leave by the roadside those harmed by sin and greed, but goes out of its way to bring healing and hope. Grant that the simple choices we make, what tea to drink, where to buy our milk, may honour your name and bring your kingdom ever closer. Amen. Amen. So I'd like to thank everybody for coming this evening. It's been wonderful. We do have another uh, workshop on the 29th of this month, which is all about the energy footprint tool uh, and filling that in. It's a bit of a clinic uh, drop in. There's some experts there to help you with that. So if you'd like to know more details about that, please just drop us an email. But I will send all the links out from this evening and uh, information about future workshops as well. So if you need to go, thank you so much for joining us. If you'd like to stay online, then you're very welcome to do so. And Anne, if you'd like to ask your question. Um, yeah, a little, uh, a, a few different things, really. There's a lot of comments in the chat about um, Tradecraft having gone, um, but there are a lot of other fair trade organisations. And as a Tradecraft Fair Trader. We've got a good Facebook page and we've got a lot of offers from Ethical Supermarket and other groups like Meaningful Chocolate to give us discount to enable us to carry on. And we've had news today from Matt, who was uh, not from um, uh, from the person who was CEO of Tradecraft, who is hoping to buy the name although there are two other people hoping to buy the name. And he's also hoping to be able to sell some of the stock in the warehouse that was um, uh, stopped being sold when, when they did go into administration. So there, there are, are a lot of fair trade organisations um, and there are a lot of opportunities to do that. Um, we have a fair trade stall at church and I take it to the local food fair and it's nice to hear that being um, shown as a place of, of local produce but I'm interested in Sarah in whether you are supplying goods and I can tag you in when we have an event so that you can see what's going on. Yeah, the, the, the things I was selling were um, woven products from Nepal and I designed a whole puppet set to go with the book and the, the market was going to be going, getting into schools and I would take the products in and do a workshop with the school to get the kids to work out how much they think things should sell for so um, I absolutely loved it but I work full time as a lecturer and my research in Nepal is quite a massive commitment and there was just no way I could run a business <laughs> Um, and I introduced a school product at the time when schools budgets were being cut like schools have very limited budgets so one thing I would say to anyone here is you know if a school invites you in to do a talk about fair trade or loaf um, do go in because they the teachers don't have the time often that they used to have it's not as in the curriculum as it used to be um, the global citizenship's still there but it's not quite as active and I think that might have an impact in the future uh, but yeah that um I, I do do I still do fairs uh, at different local events um I need to get my students helping me more uh, because you need the young people to come along and with the energy and the time you need volunteers <laughs> yeah 
Thank you, Sarah, and thank you, Barbara, as well. It's been really good this evening. Thank you. Has anyone here put on a loaf meal, I wonder? Oh, Tricia, you have. Okay, and Sue. Right. I, it's, it's quite variety. I think the most... Uh, it was an absolutely amazing experience. I think it was when in Garden City, Ed was giving a talk and the people there had put on the most amazing spread. They'd gone to huge trouble and to all the little shops around them and, the, and everything was labelled as to where it had come from, to a local village or a local farm shop, um, which was really amazing. But of course, you can also just do it with a, with a simple soup and some local bread and make it really, really easy. Sue, so what did you do? Um, well, we have uh, quite frequent bring and share lunches at, at our church with our People and Planet group. And uh, uh, for all sorts of reasons, we ask people to, to put the, what the ingredients are and where they come from. And, and it might be simple, like, you know, you're making a soup with with um, meat stock and somebody's vegetarian doesn't want it <laughs> or they're allergic to things. Um, but we add we add that they also put whether it's fair trade or organic. Um, and again, even if it's a dish that they would have cooked quite regularly, but they're one or two ingredients that they can substitute something that's simple, fair trade or whatever. Um, it's 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 work in process, progress, isn't it? Um, so, uh, yes. And there's always a discussion about where you got it and all the rest of it. Anybody mm. else? <laughs> I wonder if I can say something it's not exactly a question sure thank you um thank you so much to both of the speakers um really brilliant to hear the origins of loaf because I've used loaf for quite a few years in um various different forms and I didn't know who it came from or where it came from um I have set up a celebrations cake business in the last few years because uh, that's one of my passions and I my business is called Meg's Makery Cakes with a Conscience and so I advertise that my cakes are made with the loaf principles. Um, uh, one of the locally aspects of this is that I have my own chickens in my garden with my eggs but do you know the cost of living crisis in the pandemic is making this really hard choices because for example organic butter has pretty much doubled in yeah. price and that's why I use in my cakes so yeah. it's almost crippling my business yeah. to make these choices but I see that they're just so important and I just I'm thankful that it's something that other people are passionate about too because sometimes it's very hard to keep going with it. Yeah, it's wonderful to hear Meg. Yeah, and I understand the pressures now. But, uh, yeah, can we, can we put it in the chat where you, how to, is it, could you say it again, so, because I'm like, that sounds, that's exactly what, it's really important to have businesses that are really open about where their products are. So if, I'd love to find out more about your business, because sometimes when we yeah. do procurement or we're buying food, it's like, I don't want to buy it from the cheapest place. I want to buy quality products. So yeah, that would be great if... Uh, you could send that link to me afterwards. I'll put it in the I'll chat, Meg. I'll put it in the chat. Yep. Yeah. yeah, and there's two things I think I, I have said before, but I'll say them again. One is, you know, you may not be able to afford organic butter, but okay, still keep doing what you can. There may be a very expensive ingredient you have to change to something, but if the most of it is there, the fact that you can't do everything doesn't mean you do nothing. It's yeah. a real good thing to go by. Yeah. Um, that, that, that is, and, and with these the financial crisis I know that's causing huge problems to you as a business and to lots of individuals but there are still a lot of people out there as I said in the chat who can afford to pay more for their food and I yeah. think those of us who can should do that to keep continue buying the sustainable products in order to sustain and keep going the producers and the people like you who are using the products to, to make cakes or whatever you're making them from I think it's really important that we continue to buy sustainably in order to to support the the the, the way food should be produced 
I haven't looked into this, Megan. It might be where I've got, not, it, but my daughter's vegan and uh, was been made, had made a few cakes. And the cost of butter going up, vegan butter was always more expensive. And I'm not sure if vegan butter has gone up to the same extent that butter has. So it might start to equalize the price. Yeah. Of it. But then you have the environmental question, like where's the butter coming from? And, you know, it's, it's, there's never an, even, an answer. It's like the meat yeah. question. If you went totally vegan, your air miles go through the roof and then there's there's just every decision you have has you know different yeah. pros and cons and it is about balancing isn't it yeah it is and it's also if people then start to judge oh but you're not doing this or you're not doing that it's um I think what Barbara said of well I do the bits that I can do don't mm -hmm. you and then you kind of you just try and make the right choices before God for every little bit and I think that is so important in business isn't it because this is not a question, it's become more acute, the, the expensive question, because of our current situation over you know, the last mm -hmm. few months. But it's a question that's always been there, because organic yeah. food always is, not always, but frequently it is a bit more expensive. Yeah. Um, yeah. So people have always challenged that. But my answer has usually been, well, you could at least afford to buy one bag of organic carrots a, meat, a week. Mm -hmm. so that's all you do. That's great. You're mm -hmm. doing something. That's supporting the producer of those organic carrots. I say mm -hmm. carrots because we used to visit um, a farm up on the under the North York Moors, and he produced the most. Or, they were huge carrots mm -hmm. because it was so high up on the edge of the moor, the carrot fly couldn't get at them, and so they grew to this enormous size, and they were so delicious. <laughs> yeah, so it's supporting it's supporting growers like that. Thanks for your honesty there, Meg. I think it's wonderful what you're doing. The fact that you're putting yourself out there and you know and stick into your principles I think it is wonderful and uh, yeah hopefully from here you might get some support as well I'll I'll tag that onto my email that I send out to everybody your business but thank you for thank you that. one Next. other little thing I don't know if you guys are aware of a charity called toilet twinning mm -hmm. um, yep yeah, so they also do bin twinning and fridge twinning mm -hmm. you come across those yeah um, yeah bin so, um, in in encouragement or kind of to celebrate Earth Day this year, they are producing some recipe cards. And so they've asked my business to create three recipes that use food waste um, for cake, basically, because that's what my business is. Um, so that's in the making. But if you want to look out for bin twinning around Earth Day um, and these recipes. So there's a bread pudding that uses bread scraps. There's... Um, uh, iced biscuits that uses aquafaba instead of egg for the royal icing um, which is great isn't it it's just the chickpea water that you'd throw away normally and uh, the third one is cake pops which uses cake scraps so yeah all good look for those thank you for that that's a, that's a really interesting point and I think somebody did mention in the chat I don't know if it's a the, a third of food there's a yep. cost of crit living crisis but still we have so much food waste mm -hmm. and you know people do need to really think about exactly what you were just saying you know making the most of the products thinking about how you can you know use them in different ways and and buy less but more often when you when you do a big supermarket shop just often you then you end up with things that go off before you've had a chance to cook them so yeah I've noticed lots of vegetable packaging now doesn't have a use by date on it, which I think, hallelujah, because I think there were so many people who were looking at those dates and thinking, oh, gosh, these potatoes must be mm. out of date. I can't possibly use them and then just binning them. So I think the fact they've got rid of that is really positive. But I think yeah. you're right. It needs a bit of a campaign to encourage people that you can make really good, delicious food out of things that are lying around in your fridge. I do it all the time. And it's a soup, stews, just throw the carrots that have gone a bit bendy, stuff that's knocking around the back of the fridge and you can make amazing food, but it just needs a change in behavior, I think, doesn't it? Absolutely right. Yeah, I think a lot of people need to learn the skill that a lot of um, homesteaders in the United States have learned where they have a very short season of grow of um, vegetable gardening and they learn how to preserve and store food correctly and that's another way of reducing waste too. Mm -hmm. 
Susan, you've mm. got your hand up there very patiently. Do you want to unmute yourself and ask your question? Oh, we can't hear you, Susan. You're muted. No, I think, is it maybe to do with your headphones? Do you want to type, type your question in the chat? Can you? Oh, yes, there you go. Okay. Um, no, I was just really thankful for Barbara's contribution because, like somebody else said before, I've used and talked about the loaf principle for so long, um, tried to get it introduced within my church, but they weren't really very enthusiastic, which I find very trying. I think they have limited vision at the moment and think there are too many other things. But it, it's so useful to, to talk to people about it. And I would, I'm continually shocked. I did something today for St. David's Day and included a, a bar of Maya Gold, um, yes, Maya Gold, the first fair trade chocolate mm -hmm. in the package. And people said, oh, I didn't know about fair trade. And I'm thinking, how come you still don't know? And mm -hmm. these are reasonably intelligent people. Um, so, I mean, it's been really inspiring to hear you both. And um, Barbara, thank you so much for that. I, I, I'm not good at thinking of questions while we're, we're um, on air, but and Sarah, it's wonderful to see you again and know that Bob's mm -hmm. still around. I remember Bob and Bruce doing a big thing in Manchester many years ago, uh, in, in Liverpool many years ago, which I attended when they had the visitors from Sweden. Um, but just listening to both of you is really inspiring because I think some of us locally have found a little bit depressed about where fed sheets seem to be going, especially with regard to trade craft and some of the people who only ever new of tradecraft of goods. Um, and there's a, a big hesitancy locally for some people to go to online shopping for it. But we're talking about whether we can do something as a sort of small lower group, local group to one person buy and then the others share it. Trying to find a way around the sort of problems of not wanting to buy um, too much online if we can avoid it. So thank you very much for this. Very based, Susan. Where are you based, Susan? Oh, we lost her. I just wondered where she was, that maybe we could support her in any way. Mm -hmm. Susan, can you hear us still? Yeah, so where, where are you based? Oh, you're still, you're muted, we can't hear you. Do what you did before. <laughs> Preston, I'm sorry, I don't know what's happening, but it's something to do with these um, speak uh, earphones. Headphones. Yeah, maybe it's plugged. Can you so hear me? Are yeah. you local right. to us, Susan? Are you in Liverpool? I'll put the earphones back in to hear your response. I think she sorry said Preston. I, I think, think Preston. she said Preston. Yeah. Okay. Preston. Well done, lip reading. <laughs> so we were just wondering where you were based, Susan, but the, the others tell me that you're based in Preston. <laughs> Excellent. Anybody else done anything with loaf at the church or organisation? Tricia, do you want to share what you've done? Yes, thanks very much. It's been a really interesting evening. I've been holding a fair trade event at least once a year, although mm -hmm. most of the events we do have an element of fair trade in them and loaf in them whenever possible. Um, since about 2016, I know it's not very long compared to some of you guys, but you know, we're, we're trying. And uh, I just had an event, it wasn't specifically fair trade, but it needed to show fair trade and loaf prominently. And um, I went to the supermarkets I normally go to to get fair trade stock none of them mm -hmm. none of them had any and I ended up doing a mad supermarket dash to about six different supermarkets it's really frustrating and I just wondered if the Fair Trade Foundation are making any inroads with getting the supermarkets to stock fair trade products again yeah they they still do and um they still lobby, but I think what they really need, and this is how we got them in there in the first place, is, is then to go to customer services and fill out a card and complain, but then you need to push, like have a momentum to do that. If it's, mm -hmm. And that's what, how, that was one of the strategies that the Fair Trade Foundation used to get the products into, the, into them. Mm -hmm. 
but it Sainsbury's dominates. Sainsbury's, in theory, has the most fair trade products, but you know, it, sometimes they'll move them so that they're not in the prominent eye position. Mm -hmm. You know, they have all these strategies, and they do have a lot of power. So they do sort of play each other. You know, play each other off each each other off against each other. Yeah, it's so it's, sad. So it's sort of the flip side of the. It's good that it's mainstreamed. I think it is really important that they're accessible and affordable, but it has to be something that they're genuinely committed to. Mm. I was just going to say, I suppose Thank that's you. where churches come in or mm. organisations that if everybody goes into your local supermarket and fills out that complaints card, if, if you encourage every, or if you get a load of the complaints card and say, can you fill this in and I will take them. If everybody does that en masse, that I suppose is a little bit more people power involved in that. But you, you, you're absolutely right, Trisha. I've noticed lots of shops now are not stocking fair trade goods. I mean, I, I shop it in Aldi, that's my local supermarket. No. You can't get coffee now. I used to always mm. buy the coffee then. Mm. It was really nice coffee. My husband mm. loved it now. It's Rainforest Alliance, I think. It, if that, I, I, it might have even changed again. It's really frustrating. So I think you're right, Sarah, we, we do need to, to campaign a little bit more and use our voices and our, our power to do that. Sue, did you want to say something? Um, yes, uh, I, I live close to a waitress store and waitress, I have to say, I know people think, oh, it's posh and all that. Actually, they're dropping their, their prices hugely because of the cost of living thing. Um, but they have always supported. I mean, I think it's mainly waitress that sell Dutchy product produce, for instance, and that's all mostly organic and um, and fair trade. Um, but the local co-op, co-op, I think, are very good, good at stocking mm. stuff. And in an effort, we, we, we have a monthly, um, it used to be trade craft store, we now call it fair trade store. Um, and that comes up this coming Sunday. Um, and this time to push the fair trade bit, um, we have invited everybody at church to come and actually searching wherever they normally shop you know whether it be tesco's or or sainsbury's or whatever and um, buy something that they would normally buy but make sure it's fair trade bring it to church not so that we then sell it with their with their name on on a label and where they've bought it to try and push the idea that actually it's not that difficult um to find stuff if you know where to look um, and I know co-op do, uh, the local co-op does quite a lot um, in terms of um, or, uh, fair trade wine, for instance, and, and all sorts of things like that. But it, I think we just got to keep the pressure on the various shops where we shop so we can, um, you know, reliably say, well, look, I'm a regular customer. I come in every week. I buy your stuff, but you're not always selling what I want to buy. And that's, I, I mean, I do the same with plastic. You know, if I can't get a cauliflower that's wrapped in plastic, I leave the plastic on the, on the, shelf. On the desk or the shelf. <laughs> that's so annoying. <laughs> so, so, so there are ways and means of just just keeping going it's a bit tiring after years but we keep plodding on because yeah. you know we do have a farmer's market once a week on a Saturday but that's closed by one o'clock and lots of people are exhausted at the end of the week so um you know we we, we don't have a, a good selection of, of farmers on our doorstep being in the middle of London <laughs> yeah yeah Anything else positive that we could do, Barbara, Sarah, that can sort of help gain momentum and keep banging that draw? Well, yeah, yeah, just keep on keep on going, basically. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I mean, there are there are a lot of resources on the Green Christian website, mm -hmm. um, including, for example, a five a five session um, group study on loaf which George Dow put together for his local area down in Cornwall some two or three years ago, um, when you have an opportunity to do a service, put input into a service, you know, especially around harvest time, it's a really good time mm -hmm. to bring in these ideas, which is why we've, we've got special harvest services. In fact, we've also got a, a, a service that is based around the loaf principles, um, which was done it's still very relevant because it's, it's based on the normal Anglican Eucharistic mm -hmm. communion service 
Yeah. And um, Hugh Broadbent, I think he was, he was connected with ASWA, the Anglican Society of Welfare of Animals. He wrote this for us. Um, we looked at it fairly recent, thought, should we keep this up? And thought, yes, actually, because it's it's how you can adapt an ordinary, a normal communion service in Anglican Church and bring in the loaf principles to it. So you can incorporate that. We've got posters you can put up in your church, a leaflet you can distribute. You know, there are ways to keep on gently pushing the message. And if you if you produce food for any event with your church, then introduce the idea of can we at least have some of the food that's along these mm-hmm. lines. Mm-hmm. Uh, maybe it, if it, they can't do the whole lot, that doesn't matter. Again, my mantra, just because you can't do everything, do not do nothing. Mm-hmm. You know, get them to at least do something. If it's just fair trade coffee and tea, that's a start. Mm. Anybody else before we close? Want to say anything? Is Jean's hand up? Is it Jean? Jean, Uh, Sorry, would you like to say something? Can you hear me? Yes, I can. Um, When I find you some non fair trade coffee or tea in our church cupboard, it goes instantly into the box for the food bank. But I supply only fair trade coffee and tea to the food bank through church. Um, that's great. Thanks, Susan. Sorry, Jean, you were saying. It's okay. Um, I, I agree with you, Barbara Waitrose and the co op are very good. Our local co op here is exceptionally good. Um, we had an eco fair which included all fair trade and um, yeah, everything growing and, and lots and lots of different people. And the local um, greengrocer bought veg boxes and sold them very cheaply and it was just wonderful we had a wonderful time but the co-op excelled Mm. they gave us an enormous hamper yes mostly co-op stuff well it was co-op stuff but not all fair trade but Mm -hmm. an enormous hamper to actually raffle um that was wonderful but they also supported you in other ways they support us for our with our tea and biscuits and and they'll you know you just go in and I just go in and say, have you got any that we can take and use? Uh, uh, you know, they're kind. Not only are they giving them to us, they're saying, come and ask us if we've got anything. Something that's coming up towards its sell-by date, they kind of give to us. I think we're very blessed here in this village that the co-op is doing that for us. That's great. So but, I don't know if all co-ops in bigger, yeah, places in bigger no, cities would do it. but I'd say, Jean, that they do, because in Liverpool, when we've, historically when we've had events they've always supported mm. um they've always been very supportive and um and not everything is fair trade but they do a significant amount, amount more than others so if, if you're doing events it's always worth asking for they're, they're very 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 good and and they even let us go and sing inside the co-op and um, carols at christmas which you know <laughs> It's, all, it's, it's not anything to do with this, but it's kind of just shows their generosity to the village. Thank you. That's all I had to say, really. And it's been a wonderful evening and I won't be able to stay much longer because I'm getting thank exhausted. You oh, thank, thank you. you. Great to have you. Ian? Mm-hmm. Uh, I too have to speak very much in favour of the co-op. Uh, I, I go into schools and take assemblies and I tell them about the fair trade bananas because the uh, co-op is very close to us. Uh, Also, every Thursday, uh, we go to collect goods that are coming close to sell-by date from the co-op. All of our local co-ops sell, uh, give, a big one, give to different social supermarkets uh, in the area. Mm -hmm. Excellent. I've got no shares in the (laughs) (laughs) co-op. Yeah, just to balance it, um, but Lidl as well, it's really interesting because they've started to have a lot more fair trade products and making their own fair trade chocolate. But I remember reading an article where people say, well, they might have fair trade products, but they need to not have zero hour contracts for their staff. And it's like, but I know. Well, you need to then push them for that. So you've got to just push push everybody on everything just to be more ethical and caring. You know, it's yeah. And Sarah, that brings me to what we've always stressed with the fair trade part of the loaf principles is obviously it's linking into to the fair trade as you've been describing it of, of products from the board but we've also always had a corollary saying we also need to have fair wages mm. and fair returns for the farmers yeah. and the farm workers who are producing the food in our own country mm. so the fairly fair trade also refers to how the uk um, farmers and, and growers are mm. recompensed for the work they've put in mm. 
I think that was one of the key successes of Bruce's fair trade town movement that he did say, and it was at a time of, you know, sort of farmers were in particular stress with beef and all these different diseases. And he was saying, yeah, but buy local, you know, as well. So that really helped him bring people on board and make people connect, you know, to farmers in this country, connecting to how other farmers experience, you know, the world. Yeah. Well, I have certainly enjoyed this evening. It's been so lovely to meet you all and to hear all your different stories and what's working for you and what you need help with. And it's just wonderful to, yeah, to all come together and to talk. Thank you so much, Sarah and Barbara, for your input this evening. It's been really, really interesting and by the sounds of it, very inspiring as well. So we'll look forward to hearing what people uh, take from this and what we see start to develop but um, yeah I am going to put some complaints cards in my local supermarkets from this evening and say we need more fair trade products in them so you've certainly inspired me but I will collate all of that information that that people have shared in the chat it's been amazing um, and I will send that out to everybody but thank you so much for joining us and for giving up your time this evening especially to Sarah and Barb thanks ever so much and hope to catch you all again at another workshop that we put on. Meg, all the best with your business. <laughs> Take care, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Bye. God bless. God bless. Bye. 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 Bye.